Good afternoon and welcome to session five of the Better Investor Conference. And we're going to talk about uh, the company structures and derivative structures you can use to invest uh, not only in South Africa, but also offshore. Now, as an investment portfolio grows, uh, it is critical to consider the appropriate investment structure. And most people start out investing in their own names. But uh, once a portfolio grow to be substantial, there may be other more appropriate investment structures. Now, there are several options and all of them have their pros and cons. And uh, this session will explore the different opportunities, the limitations, the risks, and of course, the tax implications of these structures. Uh, with me is Tracy Miller. She's Head of Advice and Philanthropy at uh, NetBank Wealth Management. She has over 32 years of experience in the financial services industry, including 23 years in the wealth management and fiduciary services industry. And she leads a team of advisory specialists who provide specialist wealth management advice. She's a CFP and a registered tax practitioner. Tracy, thank you so much for, for joining me today. This is a pretty complicated topic, um, and I don't think many people really appreciate it early on in their careers or in their wealth building um, journey um, that maybe they should consider different structures uh, as, as opposed to having it in their own name. So let's start there. When do you think someone should start to think, listen, maybe I need a different structure to, to house my investments? Yeah. First of all, Rick, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I always like to use the analogy of building a house, Rick. Um, and for me, when you build a house, you've got to start with the foundation. Effectively, that's where you start. And I think what we often find in the wealth management industry is clients come in and look at what investments am I going to invest in without giving proper consideration to how should I structure those investments. So as is the case when you build a house, you've got to start with the foundation. So you need to understand what are the different ownership options that you can select and what are the consequences of those different ownership options. So if I may, just very briefly, I like to, to highlight to clients that one needs to look at the estate planning considerations in particular. So, you know, the reality is that throughout our life, we are going to go through challenging times. Um, ultimately, we're all going to die, we know that. But there could also be instances where we become incapacitated. We go through a life-changing event such as divorce or immigration. All these things have an impact on our wealth and our ability to grow our wealth. And that's why for me it's so important to understand the different legal ownership options and how they relate to the different estate planning consequences. Mm. As an example, you know, on death, will the assets continue? Will you have continuity? Will you have, if you've got vulnerable members of family, will your assets be protected? If you become incapacitated, we often spend so much time planning for death that we forget that there are other life-changing events mm -hmm. such as incapacity. Yeah, and especially the, after COVID, we've seen that absolutely. Uh, over and over again. Absolutely, and the huge impact that has on our loved ones. Another you know, consideration as well is if you are going to be investing internationally, you know, one of the reasons why one invests internationally is generally to diversify all forms of risk. Mm -hmm. One of them is sovereign risk. So if you're going to hold your assets in your individual capacity, arguably you're not going to have much protection. So I think it is important for clients to, to understand and investors to understand what are the different consequences that are linked to the different ownership options. But let's explore that because, sure. uh, you know, we're going to use a lot of terms, you know, you know owning uh, assets in your own name, uh, co-ownership or joint ownership, uh, trusts, uh, companies, trust, uh, or companies being owned by trusts, uh, and, and mm -hmm. all of them have their own pros and cons. But let's start off with the, the most sim simplistic one. Uh, an individual holds assets in, its, in his or her own name. Um, what are the pros and cons uh, of, of, of that structure and when should that person start to think, listen, I've got a substantial portfolio now, maybe I should stru uh, structure it differently. 
So I think starting with the pros, I think if you hold assets in your individual capacity, individual capacity, arguably the benefit to doing so is, is that you've got a huge amount of flexibility. You know, if you want to switch from one investment to another, you can effectively do that yourself by giving an instructor through to your wealth advisor. Um, you don't need to go through to trustees or directors of companies to get approval to do that. So I think for me, the, the benefit of holding assets in your individual name would be flexibility. But that's where it kind of stops. Mm. <laughs> because the reality is, is, is that if one becomes incapacitated or on death, one's going to look at how easily will those assets devolve to your loved ones. And as we know, from a distribution perspective, assets effectively freeze. All your assets that you own in your personal capacity freeze on death. So that means that there is a timely process that one has to go through or one's estate has to go through before your beneficiaries effectively can benefit. So <clears throat> that to me is a huge con to actually holding assets in your individual capacity. Another con would be if you are looking to create an element of protection, whether it's sovereign protection, protection against creditors, holding assets in your individual name, you're not going to be able to achieve that. Because, you know, it's kind of like being on the beach midsummer without any sun protection. You've got no protection whatsoever. Um, so I think, you know, for me, I mean, just to sum up, I would say that the, the kind of pros would be that you've got a huge amount of flexibility. But understanding that if you become incapacitated, that's where the challenges effectively come in. Um, because the assets are not going to continue. <laughs> you know, that's the reality. But life changes. So I think the moment you have dependents, uh, you have a family, uh, or you're a business owner um, with potential risks, uh, you should start to look at maybe not ho holding those assets within your own name. Uh, so once you've reached that mm -hmm. st stage, what do you do then? Absolutely. So, I mean, you spot on. I mean, you know, we all go through a life journey and I think when we're starting out, it's fine to hold assets in your individual capacity. The minute you start getting married, you start having children, you have more commitments. As the commitments start building, that's when I think you need to explore alternatives. And, you know, that's where holding assets through a trust, whether it's a trust that's established in one's lifetime or through a will, it's just about making sure that you make provision for those assets for your beneficiaries. But that's not a question of money. It's not, listen, I've got 10 million rand in the bank uh, or in, in various in investments. Now I need to look at other structures. It's a life uh, type of choice. Um, it's a life stage you reach. Then, then you need to decide, listen, I need to change. And you, you mentioned the, the word mm -hmm. trust. I think many South Africans know of trusts and uh, it is a quite commonly used um, structure. But uh, why would, give us the pros and cons of trusts and, and, and why it is uh, such an attractive uh, vehicle. So I think if we look at trusts, I think it is important to just take a step back. And I think if I look at the history of trust, and I think, if, I mean, you know, de trusts date back to the days of the Crusades, effectively. And, you know, and the whole concept of going back to the days of the Crusades was around wanting to make sure that one's assets were protected for one's loved ones, for one's beneficiaries. So in those days, you know, instead of the assets falling into the hands of the king, before you set off on your crusade, you would go to a trusted third party, you would say, these are my assets. If I don't return, this is what I would like you to do with them. I'd like you to make sure my wife is looked after, my children are looked after, etc. And I think fundamentally that's what we've got to bear in mind, is, is that if you look at trust today, I think historically trusts have been sold for the wrong reason, in all honesty. To avoid tax or pay less Absolutely. tax, yes. You know, there was a time where the tax rates for trusts were more favorable than the individual tax rates. So at that stage, you know, everybody effectively had a trust. And I think the reality is though, today, it's become far more complex. From a tax perspective, there are no longer tax benefits to holding assets in a trust. It's become a lot more onerous in terms of making sure that you appoint trustees. Even as a trustee, it's become far more onerous to administer trusts. And for that reason, I think one's got to be 
clear in terms of why is it that I'm establishing a trust. And if it's for those traditional reasons, i.e. I want to make sure that my assets are looked after for the benefit of my beneficiaries, for my loved ones, then that's a huge tick in terms of a box being ticked. If it's to save tax, trusts are not the right vehicle in which to invest. So I think it is all around going back to the traditional reasons as to why one would consider establishing a trust, as to why would, would one would do it now. I think with all of these structures as well, another important aspect is cost. You know, because with a lot of these structures comes additional cost, and cost comes in various forms. Tax is a cost. <laughs> mm. But if you're going to set up a trust and you're going to have a proper trust governance, have proper trust governance around the structure of the trust, you also want to make sure you have professional trustees. And professional trustees will come at a cost. So I think, as I, you know, as I said earlier, I think the reason for establishing the trust has to, you have to go back to fundamentals. Tax should not be a reason. Um, and if you're wanting ease of administration, it's not going to be easy, you know, in a trust structure because you've got to go through trustees, etc. Now, many people <coughs> who use a trust for the first time put in a holiday home in the trust, but and uh, some assets, but still believe they own their assets and they run it like it's their the it's alter their, ego. Ex exactly, Absolutely. and uh, it doesn't work like that. Um, there are other aspects and trustees you need to consult, and there's definitely an administrative burden. But is that the first port of call? So I think once one starts having children, and in particular when the children are minors, one really has to consider, you know, what will happen to my children if anything happens to me and my spouse? Um, and I think that's the key point. And the reality is, is if one has someone that they can trust, you know, that they can appoint as a guardian, then great. Mm -hmm. But so I think trusts play a huge role when it comes to the protection of vulnerable members of the family. So whether it's minor children, it could be elderly parents that one's looking after. And you want to make sure that if anything happens to you or to joint spouses, that those assets are going to continue, that your loved ones are going to have access to those assets. That's when a trust makes sense. But of course, Rake, there are different types of trusts. So a testamentary trust is an example. For a lot of individuals that have minor children um, will make a lot of sense. So what you do is effectively in your will, you bring in provisions to have a trust established on your death in the event of something happening to both spouses, as an example. Mm -hmm. And the assets will then be transferred to a trust and the children will be looked after by the trustees. Very important though, when you consider who you're gonna appoint as trustees, because it's, as the word says, it's somebody that you are going to trust. Um, the other alternative is to set up an inter vivis trust, which effectively is a trust that one establishes in one's lifetime. And I think the key consideration with an inter vivis trust is around, does it make sense from a value perspective in terms of assets? And, and what I mean by that is, is that if you look at the current regulatory and legislative landscape, and as I mentioned already, even if you look at what's happening from a, from a tax perspective in terms of trusts, it's become a lot more complex. And in particular, if you're looking at international trusts, mm. um, a lot of the jurisdictions, you know, they are so scared that they're going to be downgraded <laughs> that they are kind of adopting a belt and braces approach to the way they operate trusts which arguably is a good thing because you want to make sure that there are belts and base braces in place. But that all comes at an additional cost. So for me, when you're looking at considering establishing a trust in your lifetime, the value of the assets would come into, the que in come into question, um, as well as what is it that you're actually wanting to do with that trust? Because are you once again wanting to protect individuals? You know, as a business owner, you may want to get some form of creditor protection. And those are things that you can then do during your lifetime with, an, with a trust that you're an intervivus trust effectively. Yeah, we're going to get to the international scenario okay, in a while sure. <laughs> um, because that is also very, very interesting. Um, another option is a company. Many people want to invest or uh, hold assets within a company that also comes with pros and cons. Uh, what are the major ones? 
So I guess the, the cons with a company is, is that you do get an element of continuity in as much as that, you know, the assets, if they are structured and they're held within the company, there would be an element of continuity. But the key consideration with a company is ultimately who owns the shares. So if, as an example, you set up a company rake and you're 100% shareholder in that company, then arguably you don't have any continuity because now a shareholder on your death what happens to the shares? They form part of your estate. So all of those things that we were chatting about earlier around ease of administration of, on death becomes a real issue. Because, so yeah, so from a company perspective, I guess there are benefits. I mean, obviously, not that I like the tax tail to wag the dog, but obviously company tax rates are lower. I mean, it's 28% currently. So from that perspective, you've got a lower tax rate within a company, but the key consideration would be around the shareholding and who is ultimately going to own those shares. Then another popular structure is when a company is owned by a trust. So that's a bit of a two-tiered hybrid um, structure. The two-tier structure. How, yeah. but how popular is that? So we do find we do find from an investment perspective, you know, we do find that they are quite popular. Um, but once again, I think you know, the more complex the structure becomes, and you know, the more layers you start adding on, in my mind, the more complex it becomes. So from a value perspective, it's got to make sense to have a two-tier structure. Um, but I mean, theoretically, just trying to keep it simple with the two-tier structure, effectively, you would have the trust as the shareholder in the company. So from a continuity perspective, all of those things without signing hard, death becomes a non-event, the shares continue. Um, and in those instances, you know, it can make sense, but the value has got to make sense. And definitely from a cost to benefit perspective, because the more structures you bring in, so your costs increase. Mm. Yeah, uh, viewers are welcome to send us questions, event at events at moneyweb.ca.za or on the YouTube channel. Just type in the questions in the text box. Um, uh, I was hoping to keep the questions uh, to the end, but this is a very relevant one. How do you pick the uh, appropriate administrator to manage your trust? And, and what uh, are the risks involved with choosing uh, an administrator? It comes from Cuban. Uh, that must be a very important decision. Absolutely. So I think, you know, when, when selecting the right administrator, and I think one must just be, must be quite clear, because if we're looking in the local context, it's, it's, it's quite normal that you have the individual that's establishing the trust, <coughs> excuse me, that would be a trustee. Um, but what is important is because the, the kind of regulatory environment has become far more stringent than it used to be, that you do also have an independent trustee appointed. So there's two things. If you're going to appoint an independent trustee, they would act as a trustee, i.e. make decisions over that trust. And generally, if you're going to appoint a corporate trustee, that corporate trustee would then also attend to the trust administration. As, so generally, from a pricing perspective, they would charge a separate fee for trust administration and a separate fee for trustee services. So one, you know, what we do often find as well is, is that sometimes that independent trustee is an accountant, as an example. And that accountant may not be equipped to actually do the trust administration. So we often find that people try and go it alone. But I think I would exercise a word of caution against that. And so really, I mean, to answer the question, I would recommend that one considers appointing a corporate trustee that has the necessary expertise to be able to bring proper governance to the trust structure and to be able to administer it appropriately as well. But many people will say, listen, that's just an administrative function. Uh, this family will still take ownership of the assets. Uh, normally the trustees are uh, you know, the, 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 the um, man and the woman in, in, in a relationship. Mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. Husband and wife. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, maybe the kids are the uh, beneficiaries and it's still a family thing. Now we've got an insider um, also being involved in decision making. 
Uh, it, 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 it can cause friction, but it's an important function to have an active trustee, independent trustee, to also help with decision making. To bring validity to the trust? Absolutely, Rake. Um, I couldn't agree more. So it is important to have that independence that comes in as a trustee. You know, the reality is, is that for a trust to really be able to provide the benefits for which one would look to establish it, the reality is you've got to be seen to be distancing yourself from those assets. And that means relinquishing control, which a lot of South Africans have a problem with. I mean, we all do, we all want to be in control of things. The reality is we can't, I mean, we can't be in control of everything. But even more so, when you're establishing a trust, for it to be effective, you do need to relinquish control. And the way you can prove that is by appointing an independent trustee. And when you're appointing an independent trustee, it is important to make sure that you're appointing someone that's going to be able to bring the proper kind of expertise that you need to that table. Let's move on to co-ownership or joint ownership. Um, that's more an <coughs> offshore structure. And uh, what is that all about? Okay. So in the, in the South African context, if we're going to open up a bank account, Generally, we can only open up a bank account in one primary account holder's name. And in S, obviously, one's married in community of property, in which case you can have a, a joint bank account opened. In the international context, it's slightly different. Because in the international context, and in particular in your English law jurisdictions, so the UK, Channel Islands, Isle of Man, etc., there is a, a legal concept that's known by the name of a right of survivorship. And effectively what that means is, is that you can open up an international bank account and add additional account holders as joint account holders to that account. So if we just kind of, kind of try and break that down a little bit, it means that if you have a bank account that now has joint account holders added to that bank account, and one of the joint holders passes away, you've got an ease of succession from a probate perspective. Because it's as simple as the bank, effectively upon receipt of the death certificate of that one account holder, removing that account holder, and the remaining account holders stay on as account holders on that account. What a lot of people don't realize, though, is, is that this concept of right of survivorship effectively means that each account holder has 100% entitlement to that account. So during the lifetime of those account holders, they can approach the bank and say, I'd like the full amount. And the bank would be hard pressed not to allow that withdrawal to take place. So. Joint account ownership in the international context definitely has a role to play from a succession planning perspective because you don't have to go through probate and all of those things. But it is important to understand what it actually means because as I said, you know, so what we traditionally see is we would see a husband and a wife and their major mm. children all being added as account holders on this particular international bank account. So the risk to that is that the children, effectively, if they get wind of the fact that they are a joint holder, could approach that institution and, as I said, withdraw the funds from it. So it does have a role to play, but I think it is important to, to, understand, to understand that role. From an essay perspective, it becomes slightly complex. Can I interrupt you sure, there? Sure. I'm not a fiduciary mm -hmm. expert, but that bank account, is it only, uh, is it only um, relevant uh, for, for cash? Or, or can other assets also be uh, you know, included in that structure? Absolutely. So, I mean, it, you know, just as an example, we've got an international investment platform called Focus Platform through Nedbank Private Wealth International. Now, through that platform, you can effectively hold investment instruments. So it's a bank account and you can hold unit you know, trusts, you can hold shares, etc. So that account, you can actually add on joint account holders to that account. So it is, it's more than just a traditional bank account. So it is a, a structure on its own which needs some consideration, especially, uh, I would assume, for foreign investments. 
For foreign investments, absolutely. But I think what one, so, so I think just the words of caution would be to understand what that right of survivorship means and the fact that each account holder effectively has entitlement to those assets. Um, so I think that's the one important aspect to consider. And so, so yeah, I mean, I think, you know, generally it has a role to play from a probate perspective because you've got that kind of continuity. But also bear in mind that from an essay law perspective, where it can become complex if you don't have a formal written agreement that actually shows the actual ownership. Of so just as an example, Rick, you externalize your foreign investment allowance, you decide to add on your wife as co-account holder. You may view those assets as being yours, even though she's been added as a joint account holder to that account. Now, in that case, if that is the case, you should have an agreement that stipulates you view that account as being 100% owned from you from a South African law perspective. Now, with spouses, a state duty is a non-event, but the minute you have children added as joint holder, that's where it becomes relevant. And if you don't have an agreement in place that stipulates that percentage ownership, generally the kind of stopgap is, is that it would be treated as being equally owned. So if there's four account holders, 25% each. Um, but there's also other complexity because if you add, as an example, a child as a joint account holder to that account, now we have to look at from an SA tax perspective, did you donate those assets to the child or do you have a loan agreement in place? Because if it was a donation, that triggers donations tax, as you know. Mm. But it doesn't stop there, <laughs> because if the child is added as a co-account holder, what does that mean from an ongoing income tax perspective? If those assets you know, generate interest, which would be taxable here in South Africa, are they paying tax on it? So generally, you know, the kind of stopgap would be that the primary person would effectively declare 100% of the income tax, etc. Um, but these are complexities that one needs to be aware of and kind of get, their, get your mind around it as well. Yeah, and many, yeah. many people would assume that's a perfect structure for a happy family. The moment there's some friction within a family or a divorce, uh, that may also uh, affect the, the, the outcomes and um, you know, maybe uh, put more emphasis on the negatives of that structure as opposed to the positives. Absolutely. And you know, what we are finding you know, is, is that there are more and more blended families you know, now where, in fact, it's not first marriages, it's second marriages. You know, it becomes complex where you have children from previous marriages. Um, you know, with this joint account ownership, um, just as an example, it can also have um, ramifications when it comes to the accrual calculation in such a situation. I mean, effectively, the value of that account should be brought into the accrual calculation, but there would be no right of entitlement from the spouse against the other co-account holders because this right of survivorship effectively kicks in. Mm. So, yeah, but precisely, I mean, it, you know, I think it, it all works well <laughs> when everybody's getting along well, et cetera, um, but it can also create further complexities. I mean, I've just used that example now in terms of the accrual calc, um, where that can have implications. Does the structure um, or do, does the, your, your assets which you own or a family owns, um, does that have an impact on the selection of the correct structure? For example, if there's a, a property heavy portfolio, do you need to go to the trust, the, the trust route or if you have an equity portfolio, um, maybe another structure? Does the, the assets actually play a role in, in the selection of the right structure? So they do. Um, I would say they definitely do. Um, you know, if, for example, you're going to be holding just a primary residence, it wouldn't make sense necessarily to acquire that primary residence through a trust, as an example, because obviously from a CGT perspective, just looking at it from a tax perspective, you get a primary residence exclusion if you hold the asset in your individual capacity, which you wouldn't get if it was held through a trust structure. Um, so generally, I mean, I think the, the kind of general rule of thumb would be if you're going to acquire assets that have huge growth 
opportunity. So just as an example, you're starting out a business um, and that business has a huge growth opportunity. Then ideally what you would want to do is to get those shares at startup into a trust. And why? Because the value of the actual funding of that trust is going to be minimal. And what you would ultimately see is the growth would then take place through the trust, which is ideally what you want, because it's then outside of your estate. And if you have the proper trust structure to support that, um, then, as, yeah, then the assets would fall outside of your estate, which then becomes beneficial. So the types of assets definitely play a role. Um, and you know, even more so when we start looking internationally. Um, Let's talk about tax, because um, death and taxes is the saying, um, and it plays a significant role in investment decisions um, and in strategies, and obviously within the, the selection of the appropriate structures. Um, but uh, let, let's start with the offshore example, because uh, I think most mm. people understand exactly the, well, not exactly, but uh, broadly how the tax uh, regime works in South Africa. But the moment you the cross the, the Limpopo, things change, and, and some of, in some cases change significantly. Um, does the, these structures protect you, for example, from estate duties uh, and CITES tax uh, offshore? So I think the first starting point is just to bear in mind that as South Africans, we have a residence-based system of taxation. So I think that's step number one. So in fact, it doesn't matter where our assets are located, those assets would be subject to tax here. What we do have is we have double taxation agreements, etc., that come to the fore, um, which may be beneficial. When we start looking at CITES taxes, so not only do we have a residence-based system of taxation, but the minute we start acquiring assets in certain foreign jurisdictions, there could be taxes that apply in that jurisdiction or the jurisdiction where the assets effectively are situated in CITES taxes. So let's just take an example. Um, you know, if you are going to invest in UK immovable property, as an example, that property is situated in the UK. So effectively, in terms of the double taxation agreements, the UK would have taxing rights. That property would be subject to UK um, CITES taxes. And I think if we unpack CITES taxes, I think there's this perception that CITES taxes only apply insofar as death taxes are concerned, but the reality is it doesn't. You know, CITES taxes that apply to where an asset is situated, it's the full ambit of taxes. So it's income tax, capital gains tax, um, it's inheritance tax or death taxes, etc. So if one in that example of acquiring a property in the UK, if we just kind of stick mm. with that for now. So yes, you're going to fall into the UK CITES regime. There would, from an SA perspective, there would be relief provided in terms of any taxes that would be due here because effectively the UK has taxing rights on those property, on that, on that particular property. But if one were to consider now, do I hold that UK property as an example through an offshore trust? <laughs> Then one has to be aware of the fact that from a UK perspective, there have been various changes in legislation, anti-avoidance changes that effectively have come into to, to the equation. And what that effectively seeks to do is it seeks to bring any taxes that would be due on that property in the UK if it's held through an offshore trust back into the UK inheritance tax net. So, it may make sense if one is going to acquire a property in the UK to acquire it in your individual name or to acquire it in joint name as opposed to holding it through a trust. Um, I mean, I'm just using that as an example now. So it does become a lot more complex. I think the important point to take away is one needs to understand what are the tax consequences in the jurisdiction in which you're going to invest. And what are those tax consequences there in relation to the ownership option that you've effectively selected. Now, it's definitely a lot more complex. Uh, how, what role does tax havens play? Is there a way you can maybe invest or uh, set up structures in, in Guernsey and the like to, to try and also mitigate some of the risks? 
So because we have a residence-based system of taxation, the reality is, right, no. <laughs> you know, going through an offshore, what the offshore jurisdictions, your traditional tax havens, I mean, I haven't heard that term for quite a while. I mean, I think <laughs> these days it's a, I think it's an international, but I think they prefer to be known as international financial center or something, <laughs> but, but be that as a, I mean, historically, yes. Um, and I guess that was when we were still on a source-based system of taxation. Um, but the benefits of investing through an international financial centre, you know, such as the ones you've just mentioned now, is, is that generally if you're non-resident, there are no CITES taxes that apply in those jurisdictions. Um, and that's why, you know, a lot of these jurisdictions offer, you know, trusteeships, they offer the trust services where they establish international trusts for clients, because effectively the trust itself will not be taxed in that particular jurisdiction. Obviously, from an SA tax perspective, we look to tax wherever there's an SA resident involved with that trust. Um, and, you know, the minute the trustees are now going to go and acquire a UK property, that brings that trust into the UK tax net. So um, I think the short answer is investing in an international financial centre really gives one the benefit in establishing structures in those jurisdictions generally gives you the benefit that there is no tax payable in that jurisdiction. But understanding we have the residence-based system of taxation, and the minute that structure is going to invest in other jurisdictions, there could be a tax charge triggered as a result of that asset being situated in that jurisdiction. So there's no place to hide. Um, but it, Indeed. It, it, it seems <laughs> very, very complex. So uh, does your decision, how much is it influenced by the amount of money you have? Um, uh, of course, these structures would be expensive uh, from an administrative um, perspective, uh, not, you know, leaving tax out of it for, for the moment. So, so you know, how much do you think would trigger changes within your structure, um, especially if you want to move assets from South Africa offshore? So I think the reality is, and in, in particular if we start looking at a lot of these international financial centres, I mean I mentioned it earlier, but generally the regulation, legislation in these financial centres, in order for them to maintain their good standing, has become far more complex. And that comes at a cost. I mean if we just look at, you know, generally the kind of the way your money laundering legislation has opened up you know, internationally. Um, so I think all of this comes at an additional cost. So the reality is it's become a lot more expensive to set up international structures through a lot of these jurisdictions. So the reality is, is that one's got to kind of do that cost to benefit analysis. You know, one's got to look at each individual circumstances and say, based on this amount, does it make sense for me to pay these additional costs? And, and as I say, I mean, just over the past couple of years, we've just seen a, an exponential increase in fees, which is largely mm. driven by the need for these trustees to comply with the legislation and regulation in these jurisdictions. So, you know, I think a general rule of thumb, I mean, just if I were to quote something, if it's less than a million pounds, I would not set up an international trust because I don't think it's going to make sense, just in terms of the way the landscape is evolving and changing. Um, so generally, I think one has to have substantial assets these days for it to make sense to have an international trust established. It is also expensive to move assets from one structure to another. You know, if you move a property from owned by an individual into a trust, you will pay uh, transfer duties and there may be other costs uh, as well. Um, so if you procrastinate or don't, you're not proactive enough, um, a change in structure could be really, really expensive. Um, do, in your experience, do high net worth individuals appreciate that they need to be proactive to, to ensure that they, they move assets at an optimal time and into the correct structures? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, and I think one would always like to get the timing right, and hindsight is always the best, <laughs> the best route to follow. But, I mean, as I said earlier, I think, you know, the, the sooner one starts considering what are the different asset ownership structures? What are those consequences? I think the one, the sooner one starts going through that process of identifying what is going to be the best option for each individual, the sooner one starts putting those structures in place, the better. 
but you're spot on. You know, I mean, as as circumstances change, you know, one just as an example could go the route of a trust and you know, in time one finds that the benefits of that trust now no longer outweigh the cost and the cost has become more prohibitive. Um, so the key thing there is to ensure that one has an element of flexibility. And I think that's important when it comes to all of the different ownership options is to ensure that there is an element of flexibility. That if you want to unwind it, effectively you can unwind it. It's not to say that's not going to come at another tax cost because there may be a tax cost. Um, so I guess it's around going in with one's eyes open. <laughs> mm. The sooner you start it though, I think the better. It seems to me it's a, mm. a question of protecting assets and uh, continuity within a, a family um, and the trade-off may be flexibility, um, which is also critical. Um, are those the, the main factors you need to consider, uh, especially when you set up such a structure? So I think, so the first one would be around continuity. And I think when one looks at continuity, one's got to look at incapacity like we, we, looked, we, we mentioned earlier. It's not just around planning for death. It's around if I became incapacitated today, what would that mean for my loved ones? Would I get continuity? Would they have access? If I'm the one that's doing all the monthly budget and suddenly I'm incapacitated for a couple of months, what does that mean for our loved ones? So I think the continuity aspect is an important one, not just around death, but also around, as you mentioned earlier with COVID, et cetera, the lessons we've learned through that is, is that life happens. So continuity is one. The other one is around how easily will those assets transfer, in particular on death. So especially when you're holding international assets, will there be an ease of transfer, an ease of distribution of those assets? And, and or will there be a prolonged period of time before my beneficiaries get access to those assets? So continuity, distribution of assets. If we look at protection, I think there's two things we want to protect. The one is around protecting vulnerable members of family. So if we have minor children, if we have um, elderly parents that we're busy looking, you know, that, that we are caring for. Um, the other protection would be around, if you are a business owner, do you need credit protection? Um, if you are investing internationally, do you want to build in some element of sovereign protection? So those would be the two protection, mm -hmm. protection of vulnerable members of the family and protection against potential attack on assets. The next thing would be around flexibility. And I think one needs to make sure that whichever option you go, there is a back door <laughs> that effectively you mm -hmm. can unwind it if you need to, fully understanding what those costs mm -hmm. are going to be. And the last one, and I'm purposefully putting it at the end. Tax. Tax. One needs to understand what are the tax consequences? I mean, just as an example, we've seen huge amount of changes from an income tax perspective in terms of trusts and the taxation of trusts. Um, you know, we saw legislation introduced locally a good few years ago around seeking to bring interest-free loans into the tax net. In the international context, it's far more complex because we've got transfer pricing provisions and all sorts of things. Um, so one does need to understand what are the tax consequences, but it's, it's no longer tax at tops and that's what drives it. It's looking at those traditional reasons and that's why I've kind of put it in that yeah, order. You said earlier, life-changing events, you can't plan for it mm -hmm. um, and it can have a massive impact on the financial status of any uh, family. Uh, and, and that should be actually one of the core issues or core um, factors to consider. Um, what if, that what if scenario, what if you're being incapacitated, what if there's a death in a family, what if there's a divorce? Uh, and uh, that should be really, really critical and a lot of people don't really factor that into their decisions. Well, I think, you know, Rake, I think the reality is, is that we all think we, you know, it's not going to happen to us. I think that's, that's the challenge with all of us. Um, but the reality is, is that it does. I mean, just to give you a practical example, I mean, you know, my, my brother-in-law at one stage became very ill suddenly and, um, and was, you know, in ICU for, I think, almost two months. And the reality is he was the one that actually managed the finances in the relationship with my sister, his wife. 
And so in addition to this emotional trauma now of having a loved one that's in ICU, you've now also got to worry about, well, you know, are the rates going to be paid? Are all of these things going to happen? So I think the reality is these things do happen. And life has a way of happening, <laughs> whether we like it or whether we don't. And it's all around trying to plan for as many of these. We're never going to be able to plan for all of them. But it's trying to plan for as many of these life events as possible. So, I mean, a simple thing. I mean, just in that example now, um, you know, one doesn't have to go to the cost of setting up a structure. But if you are a married and you're married and you spouses in, in, in a marriage, it's about talking about finances, making sure that both spouses know where, where important documents are kept and stored. Um, and, you know, so that they have access to that information. So if that person can no longer talk, and I guess that's what we've got to look at it from. If my husband or my wife could no longer talk and they were the ones that were managing our finances, what would that situation mm -hmm. look like? Would I know how to pick up those pieces? And I think that's the important aspect. It's around having the conversation, having the conversation with your spouse. You know, this is how I manage our monthly finances. But that doesn't happen too often enough. Um, it doesn't, no. And that creates a lot of problems uh, post such a life-changing event. Um, and I think that's a message we, we really try and convey is listen, be open about uh, your finances and, and make sure that there is continuity because if there is a death, the stress involved with uh, you know access to cash can can be really significant in a in a, in a you know a grievous time in your life. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's get a bit practical. Um, what are the most popular structures used in South Africa? Um, is it normally just a, stru a trust a structure? The trust owning companies, uh, mm -hmm. in your experience, you know, if, if, if a family, um, you know, accumulates significant wealth, they really want to, to, to plan for the things we've just discussed, uh, what are the most popular structures? So I think trust is still one of the most popular structures that we are seeing from a South African perspective. And, and I think what we are seeing is, as I mentioned earlier, so it's a bit of a combination. I think, you know, with, with trust, and as I say, we're seeing a lot of blended families these days. So you've got children from previous spouses, et cetera, or marriages. And so I think trust definitely have a role to play. But because of the complexity surrounding trusts, I think what we have seen is that we've seen the establishment of new IV trusts only happening where it actually makes sense in terms of the value of assets that are going to be held in the trust structure. So I think from a South African perspective, we are still seeing that trust play a major role. I mean, we're seeing that, you know, trust play a major role from a testamentary trust perspective, mm -hmm. let alone from an IV trust perspective. Um, another area that we are seeing in particular in the high net worth space and ultra high net worth space is where clients are wanting to make sure that they start giving back and they want to start realizing those giving aspirations that the types of structures that generally we would look to establish there would also be your trust type structure. And I think it's just interesting because in a lot of instances, you know, we've, we've walked the journey as a business with a lot of our clients in terms of making sure that they have the right structure in place. They're no longer here from a charitable trust perspective as an example, but we're actually giving effect to their legacy because we're making sure that the causes that they were passionate about, that we're actually making sure that those causes benefit. So. I mean, just generally, I think trusts do play a, a large role still in the planning environment for ultra high net worth, high net worth clients. I think what we're also finding, though, is, is that, you know, certain investment vehicles, so as an example, endowment type structures, you know, your wrappers, your endowments, mm. where effectively you got your beneficiary nomination. We're also seeing that those are playing um, more of a role. And I think in particular when we look at the international context once again, um, when it comes to your two tier structures that we spoke about earlier, mm. I think in some instances it does make sense. We are seeing it, um, but that would really be for the larger value type assets from an investment portfolio um, that we would see that those types of structures are being established. Um, and in the international context, I mean, you know, the two-tier structures do have a role to play as well. 
Um, but just with the tightening of the legislation and the tax legislation in particular, we are finding that there, there are not as many two-tier structures being established as there were in the past. Interesting question from Pizzo Moremi. He says he's, he has 10 properties and uh, would it be wise to move them to a company or a trust? Um, and I think the, the transfer duties uh, would be the main uh, consideration there. So when, it, when we're looking at transferring property, I mean, there are certain, um, so obviously generally the consideration would be capital gains tax because effectively mm. you're going to be disposing of those assets and then there would be transfer costs that are payable as well. But there is a provision within the Income Tax Act where effectively you can defer those payments mm. um, and that's what's known as a Section 42 asset for share transaction. So effectively, if you were going to set up a company, you could effectively transfer those properties and defer the CGT to a later event by transferring it into that company. So, I mean, that may be an option in that particular case. Um, for, for that individual to consider, but uh, you know, it, it requires a bit of a broader discussion because once again, it shouldn't just be around tax. Yeah. It should be looking at the broader picture, but there are opportunities where one can potentially defer costs in such a situation where it makes sense to then have those properties held through a company. Another interesting question from Eleanor. Um, what are the estate planning implications of investing via trust for beneficiaries? Many uh, parents want to start portfolios for mm. their children. Uh, grandparents also want to contribute. Is a trust the correct structure for, for, for building such a, a portfolio for children? Absolutely. So, I mean, I think, you know, the whole, the benefit behind the trust is the sooner the trust owns the assets outright, the more advantages there are for beneficiaries. Um, so just as an example, I mean, I think one of the considerations when one is going to set up a trust is one's got to look at how you're going to fund that trust. And generally there's two ways. You either do it via a donation or you do it on loan account. And I touched on the changes that have come from an interest-free loan perspective. Um, so in the lifetime of the funder, there would be tax consequences and if there is a loan, that asset, that loan, the value of that loan will be an asset mm. in that lender's estate effectively. So when that lender passes away, and let's just assume that they've bequeathed that outstanding loan balance to the trust, the trust then owns those assets outright. So if the beneficiary doesn't need the funds, those assets are not in their estate. Mm. So from an estate planning perspective, there are huge advantages to, to that. And what we often find is, is that in that scenario where there are multiple children that are beneficiaries and if the trust is, sustain, is, is, is large enough, you know, that there are ways that trustees can now start almost earmarking or ring fencing the assets for each one of those children. So you may find one mm. child needs all the money and withdraws it out, but the others can pre effectively preserve the assets yeah. in the trust. So definitely huge estate planning because it would not form part of the estate effectively. Uh, last question from Kaylin. What are the tax implications of investing through a trust for a married couple looking to start a family? But I think the core of that mm -hmm. question is, do you live within your trust? Because if many families would transfer assets into a trust, but they still use them. Um, and there must be some boundaries. Uh, so in this scenario, is it a, is it a big issue? So I think, I mean, if I look at that question in particular for married couple looking to start a family. Um, so, I mean, I think I've touched on some of the mm. tax implications, but I mean, maybe just for the purposes of that view, just to, to, to reconfirm. So I think, you know, number one, when you set up a trust, you've got to transfer ownership of those assets. Generally do that in one of two ways. Um, you either sell the assets effectively on loan account, or you're gonna give the assets away. You're gonna donate them to the trustees. So there will be tax consequences on transferring those assets to the trust. I think one then, and so that's, that's kind of upfront. If you're gonna donate, there'll be donations tax, but it doesn't stop there mm. because then there, you know, there's attribution provisions. So you know, there will be ongoing taxes that are involved. So I think for me, the key consideration then would be, what are the assets you would be considering transferring to that trust when you start out your marriage? Because if you've got minor children, it may not make sense at that particular juncture 
to set up an interviewer's trust, set up a trust mm. now and fund it now in your lifetime. But it may make sense to make sure that you have a testamentary trust established in terms of a will in case anything happens yeah. to the husband and wife. Just lastly, this mm. is complicated. You need professional advice. You need uh, a professional consultant and uh, assistance to set this up. How important is it to choose the, the right uh, consultant or wealth management house uh, to do that? So, so Rake, I mean, that's a, a really good question because, you know, the minute you start investing internationally, you've got to ask yourself, is the person that I'm going to be speaking to, do they understand what these implications are? I mean, we spoke about mm. CITES tax. I mean, that's mm. a topic all on its own <laughs> in mm. terms of CITES tax and the implications around CITES tax. So, I think the important thing is to make sure that the, that you go with you speak to a reputable company, a company that has proper understanding of a lot of these nuances, um, and that a company that, in particular, if we're looking in the international context, that has a presence in those juris in, in foreign jurisdictions as well, um, and so. You know, I think it is important that you do seek to approach a professional advisor, one that has solid background, that's, you know, you know, one can operate very effectively as an independent advisor. But I think the word of caution would be if you are operate, operating as a, as a sole individual advisor, my question to that advisor would be, how are you keeping up to date with all of these changes? Because I mean, we have a team effectively that look at these kind of things that we're discussing now. And you know, as a business, we come up with house views from an advice perspective. Because effectively for us, it's, it's really trying to make sure that we can help our clients make better financial decisions, help them avoid financial disasters, and also help them realize their giving aspirations. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a broader than investment advice product suitability, which we spoke about earlier, because it's, it's looking at that wealth advice, financial planning holistically. But that mm -hmm. not, doesn't necessarily need to be two institutions. It's probably ideally one, one. institution Absolutely. where that financial advice uh, is married with your structure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and, and that's what I mean. I mean, if we look at the size of our institution as an example, as a wealth management business, I mean, this is what we do. This is why we get up in the morning. It's to make sure that clients are given appropriate advice when it comes not only to investment advice and product suitability, but also around these complex matters that we've discussed now, around what is the legal ownership option that you should be selecting? And, you know, I mean, for me, as I said earlier, I think it's all around trying to ensure clients make better financial decisions. Because, I mean, the reality is every single financial we decision we make affects our ability to protect what's important to us and to achieve our life goals and aspirations. That's the reality. Mm. So it's around partnering with someone that's going to be able to connect those financial decisions that you make to your life goals and aspirations to make sure that you are able to actually realize those. Mm. You, you've referred a few times to giving back, philanthropy, and uh, you know, obviously the ultra wealthy um, really see that as uh, giving back to society. Does that affect the structure? So it's an interesting one because you, you, you automatically linked philanthropy to ultra high net worth. And our view is, is that we really want to be able to realize all our clients, irrespective of which segment they are in, to be able to realize their giving aspirations. Because I think it's, it's key to who we are as humans that we really want to give back. And, you know, we've just launched the giving report um, very successfully recently. And that report effectively looked at the giving habits of, of high net worth individuals. But the reality is there are a lot of individuals that don't necessarily have the financial backing to be able to give financially, but they give up their time. And that to me is as important as giving financially. But effectively what we want to be able to do is to make sure that across segments we are able to enable our clients, even if it's just through 
donating their green bank backs points that they earn from a net on their net bank bank accounts back to a good cause. We want to be able to enable our clients to realise those giving aspirations and really give back. And I think as a society, if anything, the giving report showed us is that as South Africans, we are a giving society, which is hugely encouraging and uplifting. Yeah, we've covered the, that report in quite in depth on MoneyWeb, so uh, more Absolutely. information is av available there. Tracy, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Uh, I Any think it's a very, very important topic. Um, I think many people wait too long before they uh, pay attention to it. Um, and, uh, and I think in many other families, uh, not everyone is really informed as they should be about the, mm. the structures they use. But thank you so much for sharing your your insights and uh, hopefully uh, a few people will approach an advisor and, and get this ball rolling. Only a pleasure. Thank you, Rick. That's Tracy Thank Miller. You. She's from Nedbank Wealth Management. And unfortunately, it's the end of this session. The next session looks at cryptocurrency. It is a new landscape. It's a new asset class. Many people don't call it an asset class, but it's a reality. Many people look at it. And uh, tune in in five minutes and then uh, we will talk about cryptocurrency.